All right, well, good morning. Welcome to Pocono Evangelical Free Church. <clears throat> so glad that you're able to join us today and, and uh, worship the Lord together. I uh, have a whole bunch of announcements here. I thought I'd go through them real quick. Uh, online service again is, uh, is going to be on Sunday at 6.30, so keep that in mind. Um, we are having our young adults uh, meeting this week on Thursday, 6.30 here at the church, so keep that in mind as well. We are not having our Wednesday night Bible uh, and, and fellowship time. Usually we do. That's not going to be the case this week. We're going to take a week off. Just one week, but we're taking a week off, so no Wednesday night. Uh, also, no growth groups next Sunday at 10, uh, at 10 o'clock. So no growth group as well. So no Wednesday night, no growth group. But we are having young adults group and we're having our very first youth group on Tuesday night here at the church at six o'clock. So we're looking forward to having that. So if you know some some youths, uh, grades six through 12, you know, feel free to invite them. They're welcome to be here. Uh, I want to make mention again of our capital fund that we've been working on there in the back. If you have any questions on that, you can see me or dad on that. Um, also want to make mention, we are this week having a Good Friday service. So a bunch of things we're not having. Some things we are having. One thing that we're having is our Good Friday service. So keep that in mind. I'll be here at the church at 630. Uh, so lots going. Lots, some things normally we do, we're not doing. Some things that we... You know, uh, we're, we don't usually do. We are doing. So just keep it in mind. Uh, those are the things that are going on. Lots of prayer needs in our church. Uh, continue to be praying for Sharon. Uh, you're you're seeing the, the you saw the, I saw the you saw how, how'd that go? I didn't even get to talk yeah, about that. Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll keep praying for it. Okay. But uh, yeah. So so you were able to see the doctor. But just continue to be praying for for Sharon. Be praying for Georgia. Right. Uh, she's laid up for quite a while here. Hopefully uh, next week she said she wants to be able to come. Next week, hope Lord willing. Oh man, that would be great. Okay, we'll be praying for. About that yeah so continue to pray for her as she's resting and and not able to get up much uh, we had a wonderful time of prayer uh, for uh, Sam this morning at 10 a.m. Uh, we were really able to just cover him in prayer continue to be praying for Sam as he's dealing with the things he's dealing with and and the cancer and the chemo and everything that's been going on with that also we'll be praying for Melinda you're ha who's having eye surgery this Tuesday uh, for her cataracts and stuff, so continue to be praying for her as well. All right, I know there's more, but you know the Lord will cover <laughs> cover these things. You know He knows, even though we may not remember everything, He knows everything, and we can praise the Lord for that. I want to start by looking at a text in Matthew. You know, this is Palm Sunday, and we often think of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on that donkey and everything, and, and, and uh, right, rightfully so. But I also want to make mention, as we consider Palm Sunday this Sunday, that the, there's a future aspect to Palm Sunday, and that is one day when the Jewish people will be able to look and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In fact, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is speaking and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones uh, those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather her children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you are unwilling. Behold, your house is being left you desolate. For I say to you from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is important because the triumphal entry had already happened uh, back in chapter 21. And Jesus is saying that there's a future aspect to the nation of Israel one day being able to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So let's keep that in mind as we worship the Lord together. If you'd like to stand, uh, feel free to stand if you'd like to sit. Feel free to sit. If you need to move so you can see, do whatever you need to do. Well, let's sing Hosanna. Let's praise the Lord.
want to make mention there is a basket in the back for tithes and offerings. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you today. And we want to thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who is who saves us from our sins through his death on the cross and ultimately gives us life through his resurrection. Lord, we thank you and praise you that we can come before you and sing praises to you. Lord, you are a God worthy of all praise, of all honor and of all glory. Father, we do want to lift these prayer requests to you, O oh Lord. Uh, we'll think of Sharon and what she's been going through uh, with the headaches and uh, and, and dealing with her, uh, uh, the hearing. Lord, we pray that uh, uh, there would be resolve here. We pray that they'd be able to address the issues that are there in a way that would be helpful and beneficial, Father. And we pray for healing in her life there too, Father. Lord, we pray for Georgia. We pray that you would continue to heal her body uh, as she is recovering uh, from the those broken uh, bones there. And Lord, I just pray that you would encourage her. Lord, help her to know your presence right now. Lord, we look forward to the day when we can see her and be and fellowship with her. But until that day, Lord, we pray that you would just continue to be at work in her life as you heal her, Father. Lord, I pray for Melinda. I pray that you'd be with her as she gets ready to have uh, uh, surgery for her eyes, Lord. Uh, on Tuesday, we pray that you would calm any nerves, uh, be the God of comfort for her uh, as she goes there. And Lord, we pray that, that, that the surgery would be successful and would accomplish what's intended to accomplish, Father. Lord, we also lift up Sam to you. Thank you so much for the time of prayer that we had for him, Lord. We continue to lift him up to you, Lord, and trust you. We ask for healing in his body. We ask that you would deal with the cancer. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'd be with the doctors and, and, and all those involved. And Lord, we pray that you would work in and through uh, Sam, Father. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
we come to communion today, we want to look at a particular text. Uh, Pastor JJ, I think you've been doing it the past couple of uh, communions. So we've been looking at the book of John when Pastor JJ uh, shares. Uh, but I've started a series in uh, Isaiah chapter 53. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. Uh, we're going to be looking at verse 2 today. And this is a text that really speaks in prophetic forecast of what's going to be happening uh, in relationship to the cross. And so we looked, uh, the last time I did it, I think it was back in uh, the fall, uh, but we looked at uh, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. And we looked at how important it is to have faith. You cannot come and partake of communion if you don't have faith or not truly partake of it. And then the beautiful reality of God revealing. Amen? And so we looked at that whole aspect of God revealing and, and believing. Now we come to verse 2 in Isaiah chapter 53, and that is our text for today uh, related to communion. For he shall grow up, and it's speaking of Jesus here, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. It sounds like a very strange text, doesn't it? But there's some vitally important issues here that we want to look at. This text is specifically speaking of Jesus' humanity. As we partake together of the bread, we remember his what? His body. The bread represents his body. And so it's important for us to understand, as Isaiah predicted the coming of Jesus, that we understand his humanity and that he was the sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God who gave his life willingly. And so there are three things I want us to consider about Jesus' humanity before we partake together and remember him and remember his body given for us. The first thing is, it says, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Jesus just didn't come to earth and then die. Jesus came to earth as a baby. And then he grew. And it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was with him. Isn't that beautiful? Even Jesus, we don't get a whole lot of pictures of Jesus as a child, but here we do. And here are some of the things that we see in his humanity, that he grew, but he was filled with wisdom and the grace of God. Secondly, it says he had no form or comeliness. Different views on this, but I like what Gill says. His outward circumstances, there was no majesty in him, no signs of it. He, uh, um, he did not lack uh, probable that he would be a prince of Israel, much less the prince of Messiah. He was born, listen to this, he was born of mean parents, in other words, low parents, brought up in contemptible <laughs> part of the country. Isn't that true, where he was brought up? lived in a town of which no good is said to have come, <laughs> dwelt in a mean cottage or a low cottage, and worked a trade. None of these things you would expect from a prince. But in the context of him having no form, Gil brings out this truth that Jesus lived as a human. And then it says this, the third point. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Barnes says an interesting here, thing here. He says, the image to the mind's eye is as obscure as in the one case as in the other. And in both, we are directed to his moral beauty. <coughs> so what Barnes says is, both in the last thing we looked at and in this thing, we are directed to something else, to his moral beauty, his holiness, his benevolence as objects of contemplation rather than to his external appearance. Do you know almost every image that you see of Jesus, 
He's a big, strong, strapling carpenter with long, flowing, beautiful hair, with chiseled features. Am I right? (laughs) Whether he was or not, and most would agree that he probably was not because of this text, one thing that's important is God didn't want us to look on the outward appearance. Amen? Amen. But his inward appearance. And Barnes brings that out in such a powerful way. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't have glory. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh. Jesus came from heaven here down to earth, and he became flesh and dwelt among us. And then John says this. He says, We beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, And he was the most strapling, biggest, strongest man. No, he doesn't say that at all. He says what Jesus was full of, and this is so important as we partake of communion, he was full of grace and truth. Amen. The truth of the gospel is represented here in his blood being sacrificed and shed for our sins to cover our sins. And his grace is represented in his body being willingly given right from the beginning for him to become flesh. And so at this time I'd ask uh, Pastor Jay and uh, Sean, is that all right, Uh, to come up and help me with communion. Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread and broke it and said, This is my body which is given for you. Pastor Jay, would you please give thanks for the body that was given for us? Holy Father, Abba, great God, we thank you for the amazing sacrifice. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being our Passover lamb, the suffering servant. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for drinking the cup of wrath, that incredible cup of redemption, so that by your work, on Calvary's cross, by your shedding your blood. Father, we don't have words to adequately say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this bread. Lord Yeshua, Jesus, we know that we are one body. Thank you for breaking your body for us so that we can become one in you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So bless us now as we partake of this. In the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Christ said, take, eat. In the 
the same manner he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pastor J.J., will you give thanks for the cup? Father, we thank you so much for your son and his shed blood that was poured out for us. Though our sins were as scarlet, you've made us white as snow, thanks to the blood of Jesus. Lord, may we be ever grateful and thankful for what Jesus did for us on our behalf. We thank you. And we praise you. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Christ said, take, drink.
Welcome this Palm Sunday. Do we really say Hosanna? Hosanna. Lord, save we pray. Such an important concept because we do need to call out to Jesus, don't we? And, and that's what Hosanna means. It's a calling out. And so uh, praise God for that. And thank you, Pastor JJ, for leading us in worship. We've been working through a number of different areas. And today we come to the first and the last. In other words, it's probably the first thing you need to be spiritually mature. You need to be a biblical Christian. Amen? Amen. The Bible and the Word of God is what drives us to spiritual maturity. And without the Word of God, there is no faith, right? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word, the Word of God. And so today we're going to be looking at what it looks like to meditate upon the Word of God and then to apply it into our hearts and into our lives. And that kind of should be the first, but we've looked at a number of different things. We've looked at what it looks like to be a purposeful Christian, as we looked at Daniel. And then we looked at what it looks like to be a growing Christian, because a Christian shouldn't become stagnant. We need to be growing and then we looked at what it looks like to really affirm and bless others. And then we looked at what it looks like to use our mouth to provide grace and edification. And then we got into the importance of looking and examining ourselves. Boy, a good spiritual Christian knows how to examine. Amen? And then we got last week into that beautiful Psalm, Psalm 23 when we look at the importance of God restoring our soul and then us dedicating our hearts and our lives to God. And today we come to this amazing picture of meditation and application we find in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. And I'm going to be reading verse 7 and 8 for us, but verse 8 is where our text is really going to be coming from. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do all according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Father, thank you so much for this exhortation you gave to Joshua, and you give to, through Joshua, through your word to us today. May we meditate upon your word, O God, and may we make appropriate application to our hearts and our lives. Lord, we know that we need your spirit to do that, and so we pray for your spirit to open our hearts to the things from your word. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, two Sundays ago, uh, Kathy and I were gone, and we took some vacation time to go to a wedding. The wedding was uh, down south, and so we had to drive a distance, and we couldn't really make it back for Sunday. So it was a, a, a Saturday evening, and so as I was thinking about, you know, what was significant about going to a wedding? And the wedding happened to be uh, Kathy's niece, so uh, we were connecting, and we went early, and we stayed with our newest grandkid, Tegan, um, and their family. And we just were connecting left and right. We were connecting with them. Then we went over to the hotel that uh, the other kids were staying in. You saw some of them here today. Um, and uh, went into the pool. <laughs> Talk about loud with a bunch of grandkids going into the pool. And uh, we had this connection with them and the connection with their parents. And then um, the next day, er early, we started connecting with more family and connecting here and connecting there. And you know what? That is what this message is about. This message isn't about how good you read the Bible or how good you study the Bible or how good you meditate upon the Bible or even how good you apply the Bible. This message is about how well you connect with God. Amen? Amen. 
And as you read God's word, as you study God's word, as you maybe even memorize it, as you think upon it, as you come to understand it, the important thing is, is that's how you connect with God. I grew up learning about what some call quiet time. How many of you heard the term quiet time? (laughs) It's not when you get quiet. (laughs) But it's a time where you spend connecting with God through reading his word and prayer. And that's a vitally important part of the Christian life. And one of the texts of scripture that are used to defend this is our text before us today. The importance of meditation and application in the scriptures. And so today we really want to wrestle with what does it look like to meditate on the word of God? What does it look like then to observe it in our lives? And that is spiritual maturity, folks. Someone who is spiritually mature knows how to meditate and apply God's word effectively. And I hope that today's message will help us really wrestle with how do we effectively and meaningfully do this. Now we start with the word of God, this book of the law. Now, Joshua only had the five books of Moses. And those five books of Moses were called the law and often referred to as the law or the books of Moses. And so God refers to what was there because they were inspired by God, those first five books. And then the next book that was most probably added to that was the book of Joshua, which we're reading today. And so the books got further and further and further along. And then we had the Old Testament finish, and Christ came and we had what? The New Testament. And all those books, 66 and all those books, all those books are important because Paul says this about all the Word of God. He says, all Scripture is given by who? God. God and inspiration by God. So this isn't man. This isn't, oh, what did Paul say? This isn't, what did Joshua say? This is, what did God say? Because Joshua, when he writes and reflects upon this, is being moved by the Holy Spirit, according to Peter. And so we need to understand what we're talking about. There's a lot, a lot of disparaging things said about the Bible today. People who don't even know the Bible will say disparaging things about the Bible. And you know one of the most important responses you can have? I believe the Bible is from God. It's inspired by God, not man. And you know, when sometimes we bring forth truth from the Word of God, and somebody might be offended by that, I have an illustration in a moment that I'll share, where I thought the person could get offended, but they didn't. But where we might think they might be offended, guess what? They're not being offended by you if it's the Word of God. They're being offended by whom? By God. And so Joshua has this set forth right from the beginning. And that's what we need to have set forth in our understanding in our minds is what we meditate upon. It's important and the second part of this is that you shall, it shall not depart from your mouth. So here's my illustration. So as you know, I had my car totaled, so I had to have it find a new car, which is like the worst thing, isn't it? It's like it's bad enough that you don't have your old car, but now you got to go find a new car. And so I had to go find a new car, and it's very limited funds that we had to be able to do that. And I was always, you know, thinking, you know, how, how God are you going to figure this out? God has a way, as I mentioned last week. He took care of us, and we were, we were very, very thankful for a huge rebate that we were able to get in the end, and so we were able to, to get the new car. But I get into the, the, the car at the, uh, at the dealership. I get, get in the car, and the salesman, I just met him, right? Just met him. We go out in the car. I was talking to a number of different people, introduced to this guy. We get in the car. He has a car. We get in, and I share to him what happened, and he, he uses the great name, and he says, Jesus Christ. 
And as soon as he said Jesus Christ, without stopping a beat, I said, yes, I love Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, obviously, he was using it as swear word, and I turned it right around and brought forth. I think that was the Spirit of God brought forth. Hey, listen, I love Jesus Christ. Now, I imagine if one of the first words he said was a swear word, that probably we would have heard a lot of that. But there was only one swear word that came out of his mouth, and we had to go back, so we had two days interacting with this young man. And for two days, there was no other swear word that came out of his mouth. <laughs> you know, that's really important, isn't it? And God wanted Joshua to know that. And one of the things that we looked at in the context of, of this series was our mouth. And we looked at Ephesians, and we looked at Ephesians 4, verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your what? Out of your mouth. But that which is good for edification, that it may impart what? Grace. You know, when we confront somebody because they're doing something wrong, we often confront them for the wrong reason. We confront them because we don't want them to do it anymore. And that's not a bad reason in and of itself, but that's why we often confront. By the way, that's when we've been confronted, we have felt like, oh my goodness, I've just been slapped on the hand, right? But in the context of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, we saw that God has a different purpose for confrontation. He has a different purpose for us dealing with difficult situations. And it is to impart grace. Do you realize that every time Jesus disciplines you, as difficult as it may be, his intent is his grace for you? And so we start there. Joshua is told, hey, listen, make sure this book of the law does not depart from your mouth. Make sure it's a part of who you are. And then he says this, but you shall what? Meditate on it. You shall meditate on it. Now, this word, according to a number of different uh, translators as well as uh, Hebrew dictionaries, means to ponder. Ponder. What does ponder mean? Well, Jesenaeus kind of gives us a little explanation of this word as he tries to define what ponder means. And he talks about this particular word in his Hebrew dictionary, and he brings us back to where the word comes from. It means to mutter or to talk to yourself. Every once in a while I'll say to Kathy, well, what was that? And she'll just say, I I'm talking to myself. And she's almost always studying the Word of God when she says that. In other words, she's talking through the Word of God. And she says to herself, and she's muttering, and I'm thinking, I come down, I'm thinking, did you say something to me? No, I was just meditating, pondering. <clears throat> thinking it through and processing it in such a way that it's like somebody talking to themselves. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what meditating is? This particular word, it's not really used that often. It's used only 25 times in the Old Testament. But it's used 10 times in Psalms, starting with Psalm chapter 1 and verse 2. Very familiar verse, right? In verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man who doesn't do three things. <laughs> Walk in the counsel of the ungodly, right? fellowship with sinners, and thirdly, have fun with scorners. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing. But verse 2 says this, But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he ponders, Poole puts the idea of considers, talks it through to himself. Isn't that great? What a difference. Rather than letting the influences of the world move us away from God, we delight in the Word of God. 
I know there is a big problem in my spiritual life when I read the Word of God and it's not delightful. Yeah, sometimes it's painful. The Spirit of God is convicting me of sin, right? So sometimes the Word of God can be painful when it's convicting me of sin. But at the same time, it should always be the delight of my soul. And that is how David looked at it in Psalm chapter 1. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates what? Day and night. He keeps doing it over and over and over again. Do you realize, though, that the command, and there is a command there, there's an imperative there, the, the idea from Joshua, the imperative, that we should meditate upon the word of God? And it's reflected in Psalm chapter 1 and verse 2, but it's also reflected in other psalms. And so we move on in the context of Psalm, and we come to Psalm 63. And um, David also here, it's David saying, I meditate on you. So we're not just supposed to take the Bible and say, all right, all I need to do is read this and think about this. But this speaks of whom? God. And you know what Jesus said? He said, you're missing the whole point of the Old Testament law. And he says, for it speaks of me. That's what Jesus said. So from finish, beginning to finish, this is about God. And so we should meditate upon who? Upon God, upon Jesus Christ. Then, has Jesus done some good things in your life? Raise your hand if Jesus has done some good things in your life, right? Notice what it says. And this, this, this uh, context in Psalm 77 is also similarly used in Psalm 143. I will meditate upon your what? Your works. What God is doing in our lives, through his word, in other people's lives. It's important for us to be meditating upon the work of God. How is God working in you today? Think upon that. Meditate upon that. And then he says something, God says something to Joshua that's vitally important. He doesn't say, you shall meditate upon it on Sunday. Does he? Should we meditate upon it on Sunday? Amen. Amen. Yes. Right. But he says, you shall meditate upon it day and night. And by the way, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament uses what's called a present imperative, a continual command. It means it's true always to Timothy when he says meditate upon these things that he was writing that your progress may be evident to all. Hmm. Think about that for a moment. Do you realize how effective your quiet time, meditating and application, the effectiveness of that will affect how others see you? That's the context there. Paul says, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them. That's the application. You see the meditation, the application, just like in our text. And then he gives a reason. Because others will be impacted by your quiet time. Daily. Others will see. I know I'm paraphrasing again, but it's very important for us to understand. If we're feeding from the word of God, and we're living the word of God, we shine as light, and it makes an impact upon the world. Now, that brings us to a very simple question. How do we effectively do this? How do we effectively meditate upon the Word of God? Well, do you realize that nowhere in the Word of God, except to Pastor J.J. and myself, and yes, you, Pastor J., back there too, uh, but nowhere in the Scriptures are you told to read the Word of God. Timothy is. He's told to do it in the context of the congregation. But nowhere are you specifically told to read the Word of God. And I think part of that is because some probably couldn't read. But most of us here can read, right? And so the first thing is, uh, we need to read it, right? Do you know how a lot of people learn the Scriptures? 
They sang the songs. They sang the songs. Do you notice that when Jesus and Peter and Paul quote back, they often refer to what? The Psalms. Why, that's what people knew. They read it, they sang it, Pastor J.J. If you look at the life of of, um, Charles Wesley, that was his whole goal. His whole goal was to have people who may have not been able to read the Word of God learn the Word of God through music. Isn't that beautiful? And think of some of the amazing hymns that Charles Wesley wrote. They were all bathed from Scripture into music so that people would respond. And so we need to read it. We need to know it. We need to understand. And then we need to study it, folks. It's part of why you come to church. Pastor J.J. or myself or someone else has spent all week working, studying the Word of God so that we can bring it in a study format to you. That's why primarily Pastor J.J. and I use expository teaching. You say, expository teaching, what is that? Notice what we do. We work through a text of Scripture, and we go through point by point by point by point. Why? Because it's a study form. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't preach with passion, (laughs) but it means we should be studied in the context of delivering the Word of God to you. And the same with you when you go home. Take your notes. <laughs> Look at them. Consider them. Even come back on Wednesday, although there is no Wednesday Bible study this week. <laughs> Just so you know, we have Friday. <laughs> so come Friday instead of Wednesday. But let's really take time to study God's Word. How about to think upon it? That's what pondering means, right? To think upon it throughout the day. One of the real dangers I've had over the years in my quiet times is sometimes in my quiet time, I get through the text and I get through the prayer and I do all the checkoffs. That's what I learned when I was a kid, how to check it all off, right? If you're reading through the Bible, it's about three chapters a day, right? And you got to check them all off. But if you go and forget it, James says... That's foolishness. You're like a person who looks at themselves in a mirror and then they go on and forget it. Well, how are you not going to forget it? By taking a piece, a nugget that God has given you from that quiet time and thinking upon it. Let me say that again. Anytime you have your quiet time and you read the word of God, find a nugget or two or three. For me, I usually just try to find one significant nugget. And then I ponder it, I think upon it, and allow it to impact how I respond that day. Let's pray on it too. So important to read God's Word, to study God's Word, to think upon God's Word, but then to truly pray on it. Prayer is where uh, the Word of God takes wings, in a sense. And the Spirit of God starts working in our hearts as to, wow. I've always amazed that the Word of God is eternal because it doesn't matter how many times I've preached a text. I've been a pastor now for almost 39 years. And every time I preach that a text again, it's amazing that there was so much more to dig. Amen. The Word of God is eternal, folks. It never runs out. And so, let's pray on it. And finally, let's live it out. Let's live it. Which is our second point, the application. Because God didn't just say, go meditate, go meditate, go meditate. He then says, here is the purpose. Here is the aim. Here is the goal of meditation. And that's that last, that fifth idea. You need to live it out. Meditation is something that unfortunately is getting even into schools today. But it's not the right kind of meditation. You know, realize that our kids in public school are being taught this mindfulness. And that mindfulness, as I've asked them and talked to them and discovered is nothing but Eastern religion meditation. 
Isn't that amazing? Eastern religion, meditation can get into our schools and kids can be taught that, but they're not taught how to meditate and apply the word of God in their lives. You see, you can meditate upon the wrong thing and it will take you in the completely the wrong direction. Am I right? Yes. And so we need to make sure that our meditation is upon God's word and that the application of it is holy unto him. And so that brings us to this next point. He says, that you may observe. Now this word observe is actually used extensively 469 times in the Old Testament. 469 times. That's a lot, isn't it? It's used 21 times just in one psalm, Psalm 119. I know that's a long psalm, but four times in what I'm going to quote for you. In Psalm 19, 119, I'm sorry, in verse 4, it says this, You have commanded us to what? Keep. It's the same word, to observe, to keep. That's what it means, to keep. Strong also applies the idea of being watchful, to be looking. And then finally, another commentator puts this idea of having insight into it. But that's what we're talking about. We're talking about that you may observe, that you may keep. It goes on to say, keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed. What? To keep your statutes, your word. And then we drop down to verse 8 and says, I will what? Keep your statutes. So the psalmist realizes this is important. I will observe. You command me to observe. Oh, that I might observe. Lord, I am committed now to observe. And then he says this in verse 9. How shall a young man keep his way pure? We've got some young men here in this room. But we have some older men in this room. We have some younger women and some older women. This applies to all of us, folks. I'm not just going to call out someone like Cody over there. <laughs> yeah, we're going <laughs> to... But there's plenty of young men, right? What is really important? How shall a young man keep his way what? Pure. Pure. By keeping it, and the New King James says, by taking heed according to what? Your word, God. The word of God directs our paths. The word of God moves us in the right direction. The word of God keeps us in tune with Jesus Christ and his spirit. And we need to be very mindful of how important this application is. And then notice what God says to Joshua. He says, to do according to a little bit of what's written. Now that would be nice. It would let us off the hook, right? I'm doing a little bit, right? <laughs> but it doesn't say that, does it? It vitally says that to do according to what? All. All. Now this word is used a lot. According to Blue Letter, it's used 5,417 times. It's used twice right here, used in verse 7 and verse 8. This idea of all and all is vitally important. You shall love the Lord your God with something? All. There you go. And with something? All. all. And with something? All. All, and with something else, all, all, you shall love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart, all your what? Spine, all your what? Soul. And all your what? Strength. Strength. Yeah, the, the fourth one's not always used in every text. <laughs> but you guys got it really well, right? You see how important this word all is? As Strong points out, it means the whole I like that. It means the totality of it. We need to be very mindful that God doesn't want us to pick and choose from the Word of God. There is great pressure upon the church today to pick and choose. Many churches, if you go into today, are picking and choosing what portions of the Word of God they want to preach and teach. And they're wrong whether it's about the issue of homosexuality, and I realize that's offensive to people, but the word of God is clear, God. Folks, it's not about Jim. It's about what God says about it. Amen? Amen. And we can go on and on and on. There is so much in the word of God that speaks to the issues of the day. 
We are not to pick and choose. And that's the application that Joshua needed to hear from God. To do according to all, not just some, all that is written in it. And then there are some beautiful promises as we close. Good promises for Palm Sunday. <laughs> as we cry out Hosanna, which is a anthem of praise, but it also literally meant as you go back into the Psalms and realize where it came from, save we pray. And today, as we are saved from our sin for all eternity, even today, we need that kind of salvation in our sanctification, don't we? Every day, don't we need that? That's why we are taking up our cross every day, not once in a while. And so here are the promises. For then you will make your way, what? Prosperous. Prosperous. Jesenaeus, in his Hebrew definition of this particular word, says the word itself means to go through. Man, some of us are going through some difficult things, aren't we? Then Jesenaeus says this. He says to go through in order to finish well. I love that. I love that. Uh, two godly men that I watch finish well. Kathy's dad and my dad. They finished really well. They didn't stop believing. <laughs> my father-in-law never stopped, even when he could hardly coherently put a sentence together. He could still preach the gospel. He was amazing. <laughs> he would preach the gospel to anyone who came into it, that room. My dad, some of you knew my dad. Man, what a man who loved God. Who, as JG and I were talking about even last week, he would sit right up here and he'd hear the word of God and you would just see him crying, weeping. He loved the word of God that much. It would just cause him to cry. Wow. That's spiritual maturity, folks. And those are the people who prosper. As Psalm uses that exact same word, this word to prosper is used 65 times in the Old Testament. And the word success is used 63. So we have this word, he will prosper. Just as we saw in Psalm, right? Psalm verse 1, blessed is the man who does not do this. The ungodly does not do this, the sinner does not do this, the scoffer, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. He'll be like a tree planted by what? Living water. And whatever he does, he will what? Prosper. What a beautiful picture of the word of God making you who God wants you to be. When I see this, I see spiritual maturity. True biblical spiritual maturity. And then it ends with, and then you will have good success. This is a good place to end our series. Because this word good success doesn't necessarily mean the kind of success that the world looks at. This word is the word, it's used 63 times, is the word for prudence. In fact, of the 63 times it's used, it's used most in the book of Proverbs, 13 times. Just to give you an example of Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 3, to receive instruction of what? Wisdom. wisdom. And some have prudence there. Wisdom. You see, the man of God, the woman of God, knows how to meditate upon the word of God and apply it to their lives with wisdom, with prudence. And that is the call for us today as we close. Is God prospering your way? Is God giving you success by giving you his wisdom through his word? And so we've looked at a lot of different things and we close with this question and then one other thing. How do we effectively do this? First of all, we need discernment. That was our series. Our series came from Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14. That those who are mature of full age, those who are mature, know how to discern between what? Good and evil. 
It takes discipleship. I had, we don't have a lot of time because of communion, but I had like three minutes to talk about this. But I'll do it another time, Pastor JJ, or Pastor JJ will do it. But discipleship, who's discipling in your life? I'm so glad for people in my life and people who I disciple and then speak back into my life. So important. What is discipleship? Discipleship is found in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. We start at the right place, Pastor JJ. All authority has been given to me. Now, therefore, in light of that, go and make what? Disciples. And as Pastor JJ pointed out in a recent sermon, the only command there is to make so discipleship needs to be a part. We need to be growing from one another by discovering this was possibly going to be my Easter message next week, but I decided to go with Romans 1-4. But I will refer to it next week, so you'll hear again. <laughs> but it says that after the resurrection, Jesus opened their mind to understand the scriptures. That's so important. Letting God by discovering through him opening our minds. And then finally, we need to discipline ourselves, folks. Amen? Amen. We can't just be wishy-washy with the word of God and take it whenever we want. We need to be disciplined. And 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Discipline yourself for the purpose of what? Of godliness. So as we've gone through this series, we've looked at what is a spiritual Christian. It's a purposeful person. It's a growing person. It's a person who's blessing others. It's a person who knows how to edify others. It's a person who's confident. Examine yourself, right? It's a person who's dedicated. Oops, dedicated. And then finally today, where we should have started maybe, but definitely where we end. Folks, you cannot be a spiritually mature Christian unless you're a biblical Christian. Amen. And I thought that would be a really good place to end, to remind ourselves we must be biblical Christians. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, for what it means to us. Help us to really meditate upon it and apply it in our lives. Help us to be biblical Christians. Help us to truly understand the importance of your word in our church, the importance of your word in our families, and Lord, the importance of your word in our individual hearts and lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good Friday service and Easter next week. Have a great day. May the Lord bless you.